Okay, so this one, um, the, the idea was to have a little bit more storytelling in the first one. This one we're gonna go, it'll be, get a little couple points where it gets a little sciencey, but um, we'll try to leave you with something that at least I thought um, over kind of my career, kind of gravitate to this area and just thought, wow, this is so interesting. This, this part of sport is so interesting. We've, I've given you little teasers along the way, so we can move fairly quickly through the, through the first part. But um, there's a lot of themes I'm gonna co cover. One of them is just rethinking, when you say an athlete is performing well, what does that mean? We'll just touch on that a little bit. I'm gonna define what, what I'm gonna use as belief effects, what believing in something is. We're gonna talk just a little historical blurb Placebos, belief effects, they've been around forever. So this is nothing new. But the biology of belief effects, the neurochemistry, the brain chemistry, the way that the, the physiology of believing in something, that's starting to become very interesting and, and a lot of really fun, exciting research there. I'll show a couple examples of belief effect, effects in sport. And then I'm going to introduce you to a concept that I've been playing around with um, that's really like this belief effect continuum. Some, some things it's super important you believe in. Some things it's not that important. You know, maybe you believe in your surgeon, maybe you don't, but he goes in there and guess what? He fixes your bone and he doesn't really care whether you believe in him or not. He's just gonna do his job. And sometimes that's fine. And then um, I'm gonna make a comment on translating theory into practice. Now, this is a daunting agenda, but we're gonna just go touch, touch, touch all the way through it, okay? Um, performance in sport. So just to remember that your ability to win a race is obviously influenced by so many things. For me, it's a little bit easier to just talk about how your training impacts the amount of power you can produce for a given period of time. It's so simple. I'm not even putting speed in there. I'm just trying to produce more power over 20, 30, 40 minutes. You're performing better. But we all know that there's just tons of stuff that goes in to performing. So I'm gonna, for this talk, not talk about the other stuff as much. Just, just talk about like, here at 300 watts, hold on to it. Let's go, 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 go. There'll be a point where you tap out. And why, why do you tap out? And if you believe in something, does it change when you tap out? So Jim Martin and I have published some early papers on modeling how power is related to speed. And it's, it's pretty clearly defined. A lot of the software that you see out there, go back to these, it, these, these forward integration models that we've published that just show that if you produce this much power, we know rolling resistance and all this stuff, you will go this fast. So again, let's not worry about the speed, let's just worry about the power. When you, when you look at the power in a bunch of cyclists that go do a two or three week stage race, and we publish these papers, and you just take all of their maximum mean powers, the highest power they can produce for five seconds, 10 seconds, 30 seconds, a minute, and you give them three weeks of racing as hard as they can. If you, if you pull all the data off of those three weeks and you plot them on a time power continuum, we've shown that time and time again, you'll get the same power profile that you see in the lab. So again, Power is relevant to talk about. It's okay to talk about how much power you can produce. It's okay. I, I, I think there's limitations, but it's okay. So for the purpose of this talk, we're gonna be really thinking of like, how much power can you produce and how long do you hold power? And I'm trying to make the argument to you that that's, that's a relevant thing to do. Now, when you hold power, there's like continuous power. These are all the Olympic events, log transform, continuous power production. These are like BMX um, or mountain bike or road races, like we saw before. You're on, you're off, you're on, you're off. Whereas these are like, you know, individual pursuit, you know, just, just, just go as hard as you can, as hard as you can, as hard as you can, or you can't time trial. Um, for the kilo, you go all out and die in the butt. For the 40K, sometimes you negative split. So you'll revert, you'll go faster at the end than you did at the beginning because it's paced. But the thing that limits performance when you start looking at the power that underpins these efforts, a lot of times is I, I'm hurting or I don't think I can keep this up or some sensation that you manifest and you call it fatigue, I'm tired. 
someone beside me, I look at them, they look great. Look at, I, mean, I feel terrible. And so you say, the time has come for me to drop the power. You go, I'm, I'm, set, I'm setting back a little bit. Um, we have all felt that at some stage. So let's talk a little bit about belief effects because interesting belief effects, believing in something, looking at placebos, they tend to be best in areas of medicine where they're trying to manage pain or they're trying to manage depression. So pain is this joint doesn't feel good. Depression is no matter what I do, it never gets better, I'm depressed. Welcome to the Tour de France, pain and depression. That's all it is. <laughs> it's just about how uncomfortable can I make you feel? And when are you gonna give up? It's just the whole thing is, is pain and depression. Um, so I think believing in stuff is really important in elite sport. So let's go into, gotta be careful. You've all seen this. The, 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 these studies get done over and over and in different sequences. If your knee hurts and you give somebody just a placebo, nothing in it at all, a big pill works better than a small pill. A colored pill works better than a white pill. Multiple pills work better than a colored pill and a capsule beats a pill. Capsules are more effective than pills. Why? Who knows? A needle is way better than a pill and surgery trumps them all. Yeah, surgery, an orthoscope is the best way to get rid of knee pain. And you can make a lot of money out of it at the same time. Even if they don't do much. I won't tell you names. I didn't know it. Yeah. So we're gonna get we're gonna get to that. It's not easy. You gotta pull it, you gotta swing it. I went with an NBA player who had a problem with his plica. I said, I don't know what plica is. He said, well, it's a little bit vague. It's kind of down here. It's a little bit of this tissue. It's his might be problematic. I'm like, his contract and his playing time is problematic or his plica is problematic. They're like, we're going to take care of his plica. So I said, well, I need our team physician to go with you for the surgery. And he wouldn't say anything bad about it, the surgeon that went in. But he came out and he said, I can guarantee you this, this guy's going to recover really, really quickly. <laughs> I said, why? He goes, just, just trust me. Not a lot went on. <laughs> it's just going to end now. It's just like, we're good. So, but you know what? That guy felt awesome. He was like, oh my God, I'm back. I'm totally back, you know? So we know this stuff happens and the expectations are super important. I love the research that um, Ted Kapchuk is doing at Harvard. I love his papers. I love the way he writes. The placebo effect is a surrogate marker for everything that surrounds the pill. It's not just the pill. It includes the rituals, the symbols, the doctor patient encounters. And people in medicine know this and coaches know this. The healing effects of belief in medicine, uh, medical practices and spirituality um, it goes, goes way, 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 way back. And this has been studied now in so many unique settings. Shamans and healing practitioners have used placebos from earliest recorded record to treat those who are ill, primarily because they didn't know what was going on. That's all they had was the dance and the shaker. They didn't know. They didn't go to med school. Stanford wasn't teaching these guys. So they basically um, found out that they could heal a lot if they could get people to believe in them. So, so placebos have been around forever. It's interesting today, people go, oh, that's just a placebo. You still feel better. But they go, but it's just a placebo. So he took that and he won the race. Yeah, but it was just a placebo, but he won the race. Yeah, but it's just a placebo. So you can see how people are downplaying the importance of believing in something. So let's take a little historical perspective. This is a great story. John Hagar, okay? So this is the, U the UK English medicine versus US medicine. Some folks over in Boston had developed these cuffs and they were gonna take the pain away. These were Perkins tractors developed in the 1799. And it was metal, they were very expensive and you put them on your wrists and you put them on your ankles. And these would basically, because of magnetism, which was not really well understood how it worked, it was gonna draw the source, it drew out the sources of the body's distress and it would bring relief to patients. And look, a lot of people going to see doctors just need a hug. Like, they, you know, they're just, their life sucks. It's not that their body sucks, but their life sucks. And so sometimes they feel better when the doctors work with them. So this guy in the, um, in the UK, he bought a pair and then he replicated a pair, but he made them out of wood, painted wood. 
And he did a study and he showed he got exactly the same effects with wood. And wood is not magnetic. So that, that's, a, that's a problem. And there are numerous studies that do this kind of stuff. If you look at anthropology and you look at like Aztec warriors and Apaches and you look at Sparta, it's unbelievable how these small communities are just infused with rituals and symbols and meetings and leaders. And, you know, it's been bestowed, bestowed upon you from above. You can do this. This is going to work. You will go to battle and, and you will be victorious. And so we know how important this is. And if you look at the All Blacks and the U.S. Women's Cycling Team and you look at, they get into these modes where people believe they can do it. They really believe they can do it. Partly because they are doing it, but partly because they believe in it. And then like we showed with the Olympic medal count in Australia, it just starts going. Everybody starts believing in it. Um, this is a great study. If you ever get bored, you want to look up an old study, 1957 by Cannon. He outlines, and I, I mean, this is a really nice paper. And he just talks about example after example after example of situations where it looks like a person has killed another person by believing, convincing them that they're going to die. Like that you could, with, with getting someone to believe you so much that it could actually kill you. Um, there are cases in cancer where people have done autopsies and not seen the cancer they thought someone had, or they've seen it, but it hasn't been as advanced as they thought it was, and the person has died because they know they're going to die because they've got cancer. So these cases are great. You can read through them if you pull out the paper, but you know, these, these Indians that basically they sentence uh, people to death with the medicine men and they, they classify this and people monitor this. And it, it seems like this is just insane and that this couldn't happen. I'm a very skeptical guy. And I read this paper, I was like, this is crazy. You know, Brazilian Indian tribes believe chief medicine man has supernatural powers causing death from fear, lower Nigeria, healthy men have died when bewitched, Congo. This one's a great story. A person is told that if he ever eats hen meat, he's gonna die. So he'd never eat hen meat, but he went to like a party and he unknowingly ate some meat. And a couple of years later, a guy goes, you idiot, that was hen meat. Within 24 hours, he dies. <laughs> this is a great story. Like how much of it's made up and how much of it's just crap, I don't know. but. It makes me think that, um, you know, there's something going on here. This is pretty potent stuff. So the placebo then is not what you take, but it's the way in which you present yourself. What if agile physical therapy was just a little hot on the side and like ordinary? You'd have to work harder to demonstrate to people how good you are as a practitioner. It's nice when it looks good. It's nice when the whole context looks good. The reception is welcomes things in, there's degrees on the wall, there's a reputation, there's professionals, it feels good. You start to believe in what's going on. So the sight of the professionals, the interaction with other people, how people are touched, the shapes, the smells, the colors of the rooms, all of this stuff adds to the healing effect, especially when it's pain and depression. You're not gonna mend a bone faster necessarily, but there are some cases of wounds, wounds healing quicker. But, but in a lot of areas, you can bring a really big effect. This one here, um, I uh, thought was really interesting. There's in the 19, uh, 1500s, you've got um, Ty Brock. He's at University of Copenhagen and he builds the world's largest um, quadrant. These things are um, basically used to, to track where the stars are on the horizon. And he's um, an astronomer, so and he's very bright, and his measurements lead to understanding supernovas, paths of comets, like really legitimate stuff. Smart guy, cool piece of equipment. But guess who buys it? The people that buy it are those working in astrology. Because in astrology, you don't have much. You just gotta convince a king or a queen, this is when you should have a baby because the heir will rule the kingdom, or this is when to go to war, and they don't have much. So. They're like, this is awesome. I will hide behind this amazing equipment. And in elite sport, you see it all the time. People hiding behind numbers and spreadsheets and wind tunnels and magic. And you're like, you got to get to know them to say, let's boil this down into something we can hang our hat on. Because you don't want to get distracted 
on too much kind of wacky woo-woo stuff. You want to try to boil it down to be substantial. The problem is the people that usually boil it down to be substantial are not the kind of people you want to believe in. They're like irritating and smart and factual and punctual and in and out. And you kind of like the people that kind of have the look and they have the, the aura that goes with it. And so we teach a lot of our emerging sports scientists and um, you know, PhD students, it's not enough to know what to do. You've got to learn how to sell it. And that's not taught in schools right now, which is really difficult. We see it all the time. I put this in hoping Mark would come. Uh, and he said, <laughs> I gotta, we, in this area, just between us, I don't know how many people love cycling. There's a lot, or golfing. There's a lot of people that love golf. They love golfing. And you can have a swing coach that knows golfing and loves golfing too. And I bet they can go with you and say, hey, take a swing. They go, you know what? I try this, I try that. You'll get so far and I'll pay you so much. And if you bring this to the table, little bit of high class kinematic analysis, horse plates, club head speed, the whole shebang, you can get three times the payment, even if you're saying the same thing. So, so dressing it up, the message, sometimes I'm not saying this is bad. I'm like saying sometimes you just got to do it to connect and get, get through to people so that they're ready for things that, that they can really believe in. Look what we do for buildings. That, that's the Air Force Academy. Uh, you guys don't know, you've probably seen it at Colorado Springs. I was the assistant cross-country ski coach for the U.S. Air Force Academy for two years, a little extra money on the side. They, they called me Civilian Dave was my, was my name. <laughs> and I would believe in that place. Of course, the US will rule the skies and the space. Look at this place. There's nothing like it in the world. It's insane. The best of the best of the best. It's incredible. This right here is the largest NBA facility currently existing in the NBA. And I was involved with a team that got to help design it and build it. A lot of it was to just tell everybody it's got the largest square footage of any facility in the NBA. Does that matter? No one asked that question. They just good to know you got it. This is the biggest one in the NBA. University of Oregon, if you ever gone around that campus, spectacular, you know? Pyramids weren't bad, that was a nice move. Um, UFC with uh, Duncan French, you know, the guys down there, they try to make this the biggest, baddest place in the world for the biggest, baddest fighters in the world. You know, and, and the churches and the cathedrals, you know, like in Milan, they're made to inspire, they're made to help you convey belief. It's all important. So what's going on in your head? Well, a lot's going on in your head. And until we could get PET scans and really cool MRI equipment, we, we didn't know what was going on, but now the studies are just coming out one after another. And we know that when you believe in a placebo, you can activate your endogenous opioids. You can produce your own morphine-like substances in your brain. We know that when you believe in something, you can decrease pain modulating network. You can decrease transmission and pain pathways. You can induce dopamine release in the dorsal and ventral striatum. You can influence the immune system. You can modulate hormones and you can definitely have an impact on performance. So it's not just like, woo, woo, he believed in something, check it out. It's like his, the, the brain chemistry, the brain biology is changing. This, of all the placebo studies I've read, this was one of my favorites by Zubiata. So the way they did this study is they basically inject saline in the temporal mandibular joint in the jaw. They swell it up and I haven't had it done to me, but it, it hurts. It, it's, a, it's a model they use for inducing pain. And then what they do is they lay them in like an MRI scan, they're doing PET scans on them. And what they do is they have an IV in and they tell them that we're gonna be giving you morphine. The morphine is gonna take the pain away. And so what you're going to do is to tell us how much pain you're experiencing with a little clicker, and then we're going to follow your pain dissipation over time. Alone, we know what's going to happen, don't we? We totally know what's going to happen. They're going to give them saline, and they're going to say the pain goes away. No big deal. That, that wouldn't, you don't publish in nature with a study like that. But what they did is they were able to see that endogenous opioids in certain regions of the brain were increasing when they gave them the saline and it was in an anticipatory response. Now, this is where the study gets really cool. I don't know if you guys have heard much of, of naloxone. So it's a competitive binding um, uh, molecule, uh, basically a drug. 
And what you can do is you can basically block your endogenous opioids, the ones you've made, you can pre-treat the drip and you can use naloxone to block how your endogenously produced opioids bind to that receptor. You block them. So now guess what happens? You go, we're gonna give you an infusion. Last time I gave you an infusion, it was water. You believed in it, the pain went away. But guess what happens this time? They give them an infusion. They still have the anticipatory response. The endogenous opioids go up, but they don't have anything to bind to. They've been competitively excluded. Now they get anxious because they don't feel any pain go away. Pain goes the other way. They go, shit, sorry, damn, this is not working. This is not working. They get more anxious and the pain goes the other way because they expected pain relief. They didn't get pain relief. And now they're like, holy crap, mm -hmm. how long is this going to last? So it goes the other way. I thought that was unbelievable. And so they're showing basically biochemistry of what happens when you believe in certain activities. So let's look at a belief in sport. This is the classic study design, uh, these Latin square designs, where they basically will tell you, I'm gonna tell you that you're taking bicarbonate, okay? It's gonna be like a, a, a 1K, run as hard as you can. Let's see how fast you go type of effort. I'm gonna give you a buffer. So I'm gonna tell you you're, you're gonna get a buffer, or I'm gonna tell you you are not getting a buffer. This is only a placebo, okay? So they're told this. On this side, they receive the bicarbonate or they receive the placebo. So you get these really cool scenarios. One is, I told you you're going to get the drug and I give you the drug. The other is, I told you you're not on the drug and you're not getting the drug. But the next two are interesting. Because on one, I tell you you're getting um, the drug, but I don't give it to you. Classic placebo. But on the other one, I tell you you're not getting the drug. And this one's crazy. They give you, they give you the active agent. So guess what happens? When they do this kind of a study, these are the four trials down here. This is one again of many studies. They look at 1K runtime, the lower the score, the better. The lower, the lower the time, the faster you are. So let's just focus in on these two. So this person's going really, really fast, and he was not given the bicarb. He was told he got bicarb, but he was not given um, the bicarb. This one's surprising. He was given bicarb, but told he did not have bicarb. I've taken athletes to altitude training and they've said, I don't believe in altitude training. I think it's a waste of time. You go too slow. Altitude's not worth it. Why are we going to do an altitude? I've told coaches, you should leave him home. Either convince him altitude's going to work or leave him home. If he does not believe in altitude, he's going to race like shit and say, I told you. And it's so easy to race like crap, isn't it? It's the easiest thing in the world to do. So. So if he doesn't believe in this, we're losing half of our effect. This one's really interesting. A colleague of mine, Luis Burke, was involved with this study. It's a 40K time trial with and without bicarbonate. All you need to know, same thing. This case right here, they basically, that is in, in, in a zero, um, this is a control trial. Um, and what they're doing is they are having um, water um, but they're not having any carbohydrate. It's just a control trial. Now they do the study, and here they're told that they're on a placebo, but they give them carbohydrate. It comes out just like not giving them any carbohydrate. They gave them carbohydrate. Carbohydrate works in a 40K time trial. We all know it. They're told it's a placebo. That's what they got. Over here, they're basically told they're on carbohydrate, and they didn't get carbohydrate. I find this amazing. I find it incredible that it's, it's better to believe in bullshit than not to believe in stuff that works. I just think that's incredible. Yeah, it's really scary, which means we got to freaking convince people about what stuff works. It's, un it's unbelievable. This study is great. This one got a lot of press by B. They did uh, time trial performances, um, but what they did in this case is they lied to them with magnitude. They said, you're getting uh, no, you're getting no caffeine right here. And then they tell you, we're giving you a half dose caffeine. They go this much faster. And then it's like, we're gonna give you a full mega dose caffeine. And they go even a little bit quicker. And so it's like the placebo effect can be graded, which is, which is incredible. I love this with all the sleep research that's going on right now. This study, I won't go into all the details. They essentially take a big group of people, they monitor their sleep with placenography. And then what they do is they split the group. Everyone in this group is sleeping just like this group. 
But in the study, people are dressed up in white lab coats. They look the part. They're very convincing. They're sleep doctors. And they tell one group, both groups are sleeping exactly the same. They tell one group that the stuff we're seeing from your measurements is disturbing. Are you okay? And they go, well, why? I think I am. They go, no, people that sleep like you, the sleep architecture, they use fancy words. Sometimes you start forgetting things. Sometimes, you know, memory, maybe a little emotional. I don't know if you ever have a meal and think, man, maybe I need a nap. I don't know. But, <laughs> and so they plant all these seeds. And the other group, they're like, oh my God, your textbook, you're a rock star. I bet you think I'm going to quit doing something and you just keep on going. And they convince them. Within three days, their testing cognitively on different tasks changed. And they're all sleeping exactly the same. They're just convinced. So what do you think is going on with like whoop and aura and everyone? What these, 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 these belief cycles we're putting people in. Of course, your sleep was great. They go, my sleep was great. Yeah, I bet you feel better. No, I think I feel better. You know, your sleep was crap. Was it crap? Yes, it was crap. I feel like crap. It's unbelievable. The Pygmalion effect is something I stumbled on much, much later. Um, this would be something I'd love to talk to Christine's husband about, because I find this one really interesting. This was Carol Dweck kind of put us onto it. She was talking about organizational belief effects. And she said, um, have you guys, what, what you've got going on with your camps is you're doing silent running, which I like, but there's a power to having people believe in you. And you got to see how to work the two together. And the Pygmalion effect is a is an effect that's based on this story. It's a little bit weird. Uh, you know, a guy that's banished to um, Crete. He basically carves a statue out of marble. He believes in it so much, he comes to life. And so, this idea of a Pygmalion effect is that I can change you by believing in you. It happens a lot in schools. They split classrooms or they split um, uh, classes entirely. They'll tell the teacher this group is brilliant they're going to do amazing things they might get stuff wrong but they'll work it out they're incredible this group unfortunately I, someone has to teach them i don't know why they're here they're half brain dead they might get stuff right but it's usually just a fluke okay have fun they teach them math chemistry english and man when you believe in, in your students it's super super powerful the reason it's powerful is is probably because the teacher provides a warmer, more supportive climate. They teach more difficult material. They allow more time to answer questions. They provide more feedback and creating performances. So when you believe in someone, you tolerate them in ways that help them really fulfill their potential. And uh, this guy here, Gary West, who is Anna Muir's coach, he died of a motor neuron disease, which is really, really sad. But you guys have all met him, the coaches. I mean, you guys are in the room, you know, that, that, that when the time is right, you know, this, this belief is just unbelievable. You hear people, they win medals at the Olympics and say, what did you think? And you rarely hear them say, oh, I'd just like to thank David Martin because his work relief ratio on those intervals was phenomenal. And they usually say, I'd like to thank my husband or my coach or my whatever, because they believed in me even when I didn't believe in myself. How powerful that actually is. Um, so let's hit the continuum. I wrote a paper with a colleague of mine, Shana Holson, and we had many late nights talking about how powerful the placebos are. And we got into this loop of just saying, why don't we just teach people to lie? Let's lie with vigor and intent and in ways you'll never be figured out. Just lie hard, lie consistently, lie with passion. And let's change the world and make it a better place. I'm like, I know, I know, but it just something feels wrong. <laughs> it just feels wrong. And so we wrote this little editorial along the lines that if you're a scientist, you know, or a doctor, getting an outcome is one thing, but understanding why you got the outcome is another. And so it's important in many legitimate professions to actually understand the mechanisms that underpin the behaviors. That's what we're all growing off of. And so why not? Why, why just lie with something that's fake and then have somebody figure out it was just a lie and now they don't trust you anymore and it all falls apart. Why not lead with your best foot forward and say, the world of knowledge is always changing, but this is where we're at now and I'm really excited about it and I think I can help you. But you gotta sell it. You have to sell it for it to, to, to really work. So this... Oh my God. Oh my God. I know it. I know it. Um, I, it's brutal. This, this study right here was really the nail in the coffin for me. This is a study with, with women cyclists. 
a lot of women's cycling programs don't have a lot of money. So if you get a big grant, you can do a three to four week uh, altitude camp for them with like 20 to 30 girls and you can pay for everything. And they will come. You're like, I need to take a little blood and we're studying aspects of altitude. They will come. They're like, let's go. It's free. I got to train. I get all the support. We got doctors. I got nutritionists. I'm ready to go. In this study, what we did is we put them in this altitude house I was telling you about. And this is using carbon monoxide rebreathing. What you can see is hemoglobin mass changes. It's pretty standard. It's all been published. Usually you'll get over about three to four weeks, somewhere between about four to six percent increases in hemoglobin mass if they have appropriate iron and they're not sick. And, and, and there's a couple of things, but usually that's what you get. In this group here, what we did, they're all pair matched based on their initial response of hemoglobin mass and altitude. What we did is they would give blood through, we got informed consent for this, and they knew there was a variable amount of blood that would be taken. What we did is carbon monoxide we breathing, saw how much hemoglobin they were making, and then we took that amount out. So nobody went below normal, but one group did not have the increase in hemoglobin mass. So now we've got the world's first hemoglobin clamp is what that would be called. We've controlled one group for hemoglobin. So what's the working hypothesis? Well, this group's gonna have a higher VO2 max and better performance. In this group, we've knocked the mechanism out. So we're just confirming how altitude training works. But so women's altitude camp, all the national team girls are there. It's an important part of the season. Everybody's fired up, super, super competitive. What we find is when we do a four minute all out power output effort, four minutes as hard as you can, like a pursuit, on an inertial loaded bike that feels a lot like riding a real bike. With girls that have done this test multiple times before, so we've got a good baseline, we see that both groups have about a three and a half to 4% improvement in four minute power output, which is an effort that is heavily dominated by the aerobic energy yielding pathways. And we're like, what? You know, we took these girls have no blood. We took the blood out. <laughs> what happened? How can you do that? Okay. Now these girls, um, they had a second test and they had to go at their baseline VO2 max power and hold it for as long as they could. And this test happened 10 minutes after the first test. And what we found there, which was very good to see, is that in the group with the hemoglobin mass, they had an increase in ride time till exhaustion, but in the group we took the blood out, they had no change and in some, a decrease in their ride time to exhaustion. So the take home message was that you can believe in some things, but you can't believe in others. <laughs> Belief only takes you so far. I believe I can fly. You're like, okay, why don't we try that later, Tiger? You know, that, that might not be the best thing to believe in. Road time are harder than the pursuit. Yeah. Oh, I would, as a road time trialist, I would totally agree. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's a suffer fest for sure. You get to suffer more. I will never forget Cadell telling me after a laboratory 30 minute time trial, and he had one of his best scores ever. And he said, I'm fit, I'm producing more power, but it hurts like hell. When is it going to stop hurting? And I was like, here's this trick, you know, when you get really fit, you just hurt longer. <laughs> you, can, you can hurt forever. You can go right out of the start and just suffer like a dog for 40K. And when you're not fit, you can't. You just get, you just do it a little bit. So this is how we would kind of teach it down in Australia. We talk about the belief effect continuum. And that is, if you're in a hospital and you're working with bones and tendons and ligaments and meniscus and cartilage and cancer, these are serious issues. They need serious treatment. They need somebody that knows what they're doing appropriately. And it does not matter in these environments whether you believe in the person that's helping you or not. It's just got to get done. Okay. I don't care if you believe in the vaccine or not vaccine. Just who gives it to you? Who doesn't? You know, there's just going to be some data that shows efficacy. But when you go out here, this is this is hospitals. And you know. Christine, you've got a great personality, but not everyone does. And it doesn't matter, does it? They just got to get the job done. Okay. But when you go over here, I'm sore and tired and depressed and feel a little off and anxious. I think I'm unmotivated. I'm bored. I feel weak. I don't know. It's just not right. 
They just need a hug. They need, a, they need something to believe in. Almost anything will work as long as you're organized and you get on it and you have confidence and you connect with them. Almost anything will work in those areas. The trick is to not confuse all of those treatments that are easy to dish out. If you go too far down the rabbit hole and you're doing stuff that has no mechanism, we had these bracelets for a bit. They had a crystal in them. I think you guys might have seen them as well. You know, people, people would show them to me and say, what do you think? Because I really think these surfers, they're way better when they use them. I, it, they work. I'm saying they, they work. You can't argue that. You put it on, he surfs better, it's working. But that whole thing of the crystals aligning with these inner meridians of energy and that that is, that's fruit loopy, dude. There's no <laughs> way in hell that is right. Um, and so you just got to call people up on it. So translating theory into practice, I'm going to finish with this one right here. Last slide. The idea of how do we play around with areas where you've got super high scientific support or low scientific support. And you're working with a patient or an athlete that has no belief at all in what you're doing, or super high belief in what you're doing. And I find myself in that world a lot, um, especially with elite athletes, especially in the NBA. Um, even with the job I'm doing now with Mark, it, the people that believe in stuff strongly, I don't think they're right. I think they're, I, they can't prove they're right. I don't think they're right. They're not right. But they believe that they believe they got it. So this is how I approach it. Um, if, if the scientific evidence is really, really high and the belief is really, really um, high, so the, the person believes in it and the scientist believes in it, everything's good. We're going to go to altitude. Oh, I love altitude. I think it works. I think it works too. Great. Let's go. Done. Easy. Um, the scientific support is low, crystals improving, you know, fatigue resistance and unstable environments. The athlete goes, I don't believe in it. I don't think it can work. It's ridiculous. Should I use it? They don't believe in it. You don't believe in it. Done. But now you get into the fun ones, okay? So right here, the scientific support is really, really high. The scientists and coaches loving it, but the athlete doesn't believe in it at all. So this is what I do. Um, I wait till, because you don't want to have a fight. It, that never gets you anywhere. So what I usually do, I did this a lot in basketball, is I just wait until they had a bad game and everyone's going to have a bad game. And then what I do is I try to beat up the stuff they do believe in, which is what the salesmen are doing to me. So if they're having a really shitty game, I'm like yeah, that shooting sleeve, every time you wear it, it seems like you're off. I don't know if it's too tight or too loose. I go, really? Ah, oh, I could work you up some data. And another thing, you know, they did with that little carbon fiber thing to make you jump higher. I uh, maybe it's throwing off your shot. I've never seen you shoot this bad, but I'm just saying, I'm just saying. So I go in and attack the hell in a really credible, kind way. The stuff they're doing that I don't believe in. I try to just beat the crap out of it. And sometimes what will happen is you will go, well, what would you do? And then I got, then you got them. Then you got them. You know, like, I'll tell you, come in the, I'll show you what I, but only, only if you want it, I think this would really work. Well, I'll give it a go. And then you got to, as soon as you see wins, you got to double down, you know, hard. The other one is uh, over here, the belief effect by the athlete is super, super high. Um, oh, the other one you do here is use archetypes, you know. You know, you know, LeBron James, you know, uh, Joel Embiid, like if the guy's on the team, you know, you know, he's, he's doing this. They, they don't believe in it, but they're like, he is? Oh yeah, MVP this year, you never know. Like, oh, well, maybe, can I, can I get a little of that? So that, that kind of helps sometimes too. This one here, the belief of that is uh, right now, the scientists, the scientific support is very, very low. The athlete is, is super, super excited, you know, about, about what they're doing. And so the same thing, you just wait, it's timing seems to be everything. The archetypes is where I went with the higher one. And down here, they, they believe in it super, super high. You don't think it works, you just wait. You just basically wait until um, the world starts to tumble on them a bit, get other people around you that can try to help convince them. When they're weak, you can't convince anyone when they're strong and things are going well. You gotta wait till it gets uh, weak and they get a little bit vulnerable. So those are some of my thoughts on the belief effect. And if you believe in belief effects, then they're always going to work. And if you don't believe in belief effects, 
then you should go be an orthopedic surgeon, you know, because it does some of it, it doesn't, doesn't bother us much. Thanks for your time. It was fun to talk about cycling again. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, that's great. You guys have any questions? Yeah. And I probably don't remember the author. I read some research only like five years ago about Swissy Well Fest and how there was a study where the people in the study actually knew that it was Swissy Well Fest. Yeah. Yeah. And they, but they still went through all the schools. Yeah. Still prescribed by doctors. Still paid. Still got to get their pills. Yeah. And it actually worked. Yeah. Yeah, and Mark, Mark probably knows about this stuff too. It's crazy, isn't it, for pains, creams, and lotions. You can go on the internet right now and buy placebo ointments, and they will tell you it's just a placebo, but you pay for it and get it and open it up and rub it on, and the pain will go away. It doesn't work as well as it's a placebo. Right. If you tell them it's right. Right, right. Ah. Yes. Yes. It's um it's a Passerman is one of the studies that people cite a lot in that area. And I actually took those slides out for time. And it is, they call it the bliss point where you get regions of your brain that light up and they hold like when you eat chocolate or have a little wine. And it lasts for you know maybe five to fifteen seconds, and just like Mark said, that'll be like three hundred dollar. You know, this is unbelievable from the hills of Napa, and they're like this this cheap crap here. Just we're doing it just to balance it. Same wine, and it's just like amazing. Yeah. So one interesting placebo study I saw when I heard from John Blackie on the Australian Oh, that's Lorimer Mosley. Yeah, Lorimer. Yeah. He said that um, they took the dentists. Told them every Tuesday, we're not going to give you pain meds to give to your patients. It's going to be placebo. And so they did not inform the patient that the, the dentist went in with pain medicine in the vial, but he thought there was no pain medicine. But his behavior, his behavior changed when implementing the pain without you with know, a little less confidence. Yeah. Pain on, People came on Tuesday. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. Those are just, I took another picture out because I didn't want to, um, I didn't want to reveal too many names, but I made a slide of all the orthopedic surgeons working in the NBA because I'd have to take the athletes around to meet them and, and help just coordinate the case. And I mean, you guys have seen them there. They look like models, all of them. They're just beautiful. It's just, they're just beautiful people. Just, they look just amazing. <laughs> I was like, does anyone do surgery on, on an NBA player that just looks like a normal person? <laughs> like they're all like glamour type of hello, welcome to them. And it's just unbelievable the presence. And HSS, I haven't done a lot through Stanford, but you know, just the rooms and the consulting rooms and the VIP and that. I'm like, wow, I'm healed already. I just got here. It's unbelievable. <laughs> yeah, those are good, Mark. Those are good. Dr. Martin, I was curious, uh, how do we get you to guest lecture at Samuel Merritt? <laughs> oh, well, you just talk to my agent and no. <laughs> <laughs> Ask, um, ask uh, Amy to hook us up and if timing is good, you know, I, I love this stuff. So um, maybe we can make something work out. Yeah. Awesome. It would be awesome to hear. I'm a physical therapy student, by the way. So. Oh, great. It's very, very relevant. It seems. Well, hopefully someday you'll get a job at Agile PT. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. Yeah. 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 Unbelievable. Yeah. Way more than anybody else I've seen. Like, how would you think you're a kind of friend of the world? Like, that's great. And then we'd be, what's my athlete? I'm sure it's, you can just guy and the team, but you could raise, you know, put ropes, you would latch
it race. I mean, the, the big video they showed me early on when I got to the Sixers was um, Allen Iverson talking about practice. You know, it's just his practice. Like, I just, it doesn't, it's just not like I'm amazing and I just need an environment to show you how amazing I am versus those that believe like the training is important. I have to give everything I've got. I'm inducing changes that will help me compete. Um, the whole Carol Dweck stuff, you know, is a lot about, I was born great and others are like, I am making myself great. And it tends to be making yourself great is better than thinking you're born great. But I think, I think some people I've seen them too, they're just racers. They're like, I am great. You give me the right, I will kick all your butts, you know? And they're mm -hmm. so competitive. They're like, I will do it. That's who I am. Where other people are a bit more like, I've got to pay my dues and do my job and train hard and Racing reveals uh, uh, insight to, uh, sorry, training reveals insights into racing. And I'd rather die in training and cruise in racing, you yeah. know. That, that, and so what you see is kind of even Steven. But you are right. There are some people that just, they need the anxiety, they need the intensity. Yeah. Like physiologically different, right? Yeah. Where does that power level intensify your too much is acting at this? Yeah, and that's why it's really, um, you know, the one thing and I've gotten the trap too is with a lot of predictive modeling, you start to limit people and you don't want to limit people, you want to inspire people. Um, one thing Cadell said uh, when he reflected on his career, he said, when I got to the AIS and they said, they wondered if, if everything was calibrated right, and then they recalibrated and I tested again and I still had one of the highest VO2 maxes. And he said, Dave Martin's tested Lance Armstrong and my VO2 max is higher than Lance Armstrong. So I, I got more aerobic capacity than him. My power to weight is better than him. My threshold is higher in watts per kg than him. So if he can be great, why can't I be great? So he's inspired. He did go through a phase of his career where he's like, if I got better physiology, how come he keeps kicking my ass? So <laughs> that happened as well. That, that yeah, yeah, yeah. No. That's, that's uh, and that's probably not on the agenda today. <laughs> For those of you listening in, we are disconnecting. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Today, I don't know if you guys follow my wife's big tennis fan. There was this 18, 19 year old that played each other for the final of the US Open tennis tournament. And uh, the one just turned 19 a couple days ago beat Osaka, Ferber, Italina. Three other Grand Slam champions, and I mean, with no no performance background or history at all, but just probably just had nothing to lose. Yeah, yeah, nothing, yeah. Nobody yeah. yeah. had expectation. The other, the others, the, the champs, had everything to lose. The this, this, this person that was totally unknown. Yeah, and they just they basically folded. Yeah, I thought that both of them were relatively. I mean, like you say, it's eighteen and nineteen. That's right. The That's 18 year old it. played in Wimbledon and made a, a very decent showing, but then I won't be a yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Now, the, the fighter pilot sort I love is they talk about the two C's aligning the two C's competency, knowing what can you do with that plane, and confidence, what are you willing to do with that plane. And if you're confident but not competent, you die, you, you augur it, you can't do it. And if you're um, very competent, but not confident, then you're wasting the plane. The, the plane can do way more than you're making it do. And we've used that with athletes as well. Like you're capable of this, but you're just not confident in it. And sometimes if they get the right coach that helps help them believe in themselves, they move up. But there are other people that are way too confident. They're doing stuff and you're just like that. How do you think that was gonna work out for you? you know? You're 40k in the Perry Rubey. What did you think was going to happen? You know, yeah. Well, that was fun. I enjoyed talking about siphon again. So, yeah, no, thanks for the chance. That was great.